chapter 9. Drew awoke with the uneasy feeling of having slept but not properly rested. His mind took a few moments to wake up, and he tried to remember why he was in bed so late in the day. When the memory of the previous evening surfaced, he wished he could forget it again, and that it had all been part of some nightmare. He stayed in bed, staring at the roughly patterned ceiling, allowing his eyes to find hidden patterns in the ridges. This helped him to escape the image in his mind's eye of the body, the deepening pool of blood, and the eyes that had led him to the clearing. Eventually, hunger got the better of him, and he pulled himself out of bed and into his dressing gown. He slowly traipsed downstairs barefoot, ignoring the pile of letters on the doormat, and he went through to the small kitchen. He switched on the grill, and while it warmed up, he cut two thick slices from half a loaf of bread which he placed under it. The kettle was switched on, and he made himself a cup of tea. While it brewed, he stood and stared out of the window, and was quickly lost again to the looping film of the previous night that played itself over and over in his mind. The weather had calmed from last night, and was in much the same mood as it had been when Banks and Frank had found him. It was only at this point that he remembered the third man, the inspector. He wanted to know everything, no matter how strange it might sound, he recalled were his words. Drew sighed and watched the trees blowing dreamily in the wind. Would the truth end his short career in policing? Would hiding the truth allow a murderer to go unpunished? He was only disturbed from the reverie with the smell of burning alerted him to the toast. He quickly removed the grill from the heat, but it was too late. The bread was burned on one side and still pale and white on the other. He threw the wasted effort into the bin, sliced another two from the loaf and tried again. This time he sat and watched as the bread slowly changed colour, turning it when the brown was warm, friendly and smelt delicious. He then watched the other side slowly brown. The process was quite therapeutic, almost beautiful to watch. He buttered the toast, sipped his tea, continuing his vigil out of the window as he crunched through the first slice. He thought hard about the eyes. He needed to know what they were, even if the explanation sounded mad. It was this thirst for an explanation that made him follow them into the copse in the first place, and he cursed his inquisitiveness. He cursed Banks for his lack of knowledge on basic police procedures. He cursed Frank for putting him here in the first place, but realised there was no one to blame but himself. At any point in the past 12 months, he could have said no to any of the requests that had been put to him, but he hadn't. He was too good a policeman, too dedicated to his job, and to the memory of his father to disagree with anything that was asked of him. He realised that the only thing he could do was tell the inspector everything, and hoped that he could offer an explanation to him as to what had happened and what he had seen. The more he dwelled on what could have been, the more explanations came into his head, and none of them favoured his sanity. He realised suddenly that he had stopped eating. He wasn't sure how long ago his hand had stopped moving back and forth to his mouth, but the toast was cold and the tea had stopped steaming. His kitchen clock ticked resolutely on, heading undaunted into the second half of 11 o'clock. His mind had been made up. There was only one man he could talk to about his experience last night, and though the consequences of his honesty weighed on his mind, the thought of keeping his secret and slowly driving himself into madness weighed heavier. He put more water in the kettle to make a fresh brew, and while the water slowly heated on the gas stove, he went to the telephone in the hallway and called Nettlewood Station to announce his readiness of an interview with the inspector. Chapter 10 There's a fog forming, Frank commented conversationally as he drove the two men away from the Major's bungalow. The inspector gazed out of the window. Indeed, a fog was forming, though it was still low, barely above knee height, as the meagre heat of the late morning forced the moisture from the previous night back into the air. The grey mist crept eerily up, whooshing into confused eddies as the Ford Anglia trundled carefully back along the road and toward Firestone. Indeed, it is quite beautiful after a tremulous night, the inspector replied, although I fear the storm is far from over. Before the sergeant had a chance to question the inspector's and Aglo's comment, the radio in his car suddenly cracked into life. Between shrieks of static, a woman's voice could be heard saying, NW2, this is base, come in, over. Frank picked up the receiver. This is NW2, go ahead, Dorothy, over. Morning, Sarge. Just had a call from Drew, he's up and about. Says he's ready to speak to the inspector now, over. Roger that, Dorothy. I'll get back to you when we know our schedule, over. Right you are, Sarge. You know where I am, over and out. The radio spat static at them for a moment and went back to his previous silence. Well, no time like the present. Shall we head for young Drew's house now? It might be proper to warn him we're on our way, Frank protested gently. Nonsense. I'm sure he is as eager to speak to me as I am to listen to him. Now, let us get to him so as to ease his mind of the burden. 
Frank frowned and failed to hide it from the inspector, but did not follow up on the comment. There was no need to change their course. Drew's house was in a pocket of houses on the outskirts of Firestone, but the Major's was further out, and so they trundled through the fog and between the trees towards Drew's small home. The inspector left Frank in his thoughtful reverie, indifferent to the reasons for his silence. Frank thought about what the inspector meant about the storm not being over, and the burden Drew carried. Shortly they reached Drew's house, and Frank pulled up outside, parking across the drive. He had stopped the engine and unbuckled his seatbelt before the inspector spoke. Thank you for your services as taxi sergeant. I'm sure that the task is, perhaps, a little below a man of your stature. I'm sure you have matters of a more pressing nature awaiting you at Nettlewood Station, so perhaps it would be best if you attend to them and leave me to talk to young Drew alone. No doubt he will be more than happy to drive me back to the station later. He uttered the words with such finality as to not allow Frank any room for argument. Frank was eager to see Drew himself, to reassure him, and to receive a report on the events he had witnessed. As if conscious of this, the inspector continued, There will be ample time for you and Drew to converse, but for now I need to see him alone. Frank wanted to see Drew, but also found himself grateful to be leaving the inspector behind. Though he gave a friendly air of openness, and was approachable and considerate of the situation that had fallen upon the town, it was also hugely intimidating. Frank wanted nothing more than to leave him behind and immerse himself in the familiar goings-on of his small constabulary. He knew this meant leaving Drew to experience the strange effect this man had on people, and he felt guilt and self-reprieve at leaving him at the poor boy's doorstep unexpected and unannounced, but he also realised he was powerless to do anything else. Of course, please wish Drew my best. If either of you need me, I'll be at Nettlewood waiting your call, he found himself saying unwillingly. The inspector swung open his door and stepped out into the steadily thickening fog. Indeed, thank you, Sergeant. See you soon, I'm sure, he replied. Powers to stop him, unable to probe the inspector on this or any of his other leading comments, the sergeant started the engine again and pulled away into the misty morning as the inspector walked up to the drive and rapped his knuckle on the front door three times. Chapter 11 Drew replaced the receiver and tapped the handset thoughtfully. He was aware he had no choice in what he had to do, but he still felt a twist of unease in his stomach at the events that would, not, that would now follow. He returned to the kitchen and poured the boiled water onto the leaves in the pot, then slowly stalked upstairs, where he brushed his teeth and dressed, not in his uniform, but in comfortable jeans and a dark red shirt. Somehow, being dressed made him feel more confident, gave him a greater conviction in his story. He descended the stairs and finished making the tea, then passed into his living room where he switched on the wireless. He had it tuned, as always, to the World Service, and he listened to an interview with the Minister of Farming while he waited for the news at eleven. Hearing the drone of the voices, the dullness of the subject, gave him a greater distance from the rea reality he faced. Outside of the woods, beyond the limits of the trees, the world continued to twist and turn with the daily traumas that people fought to overcome and adapt to. Now his own burden had been added to, and he wondered if he had the strength of mind to see it through to the conclusion, and what form that conclusion would take when it arrived. He wondered how it would shape him, where he would be when the end finally came. He blew air across the surface of his tea and watched steam as it drifted and dissipated into the room. Would this be the end of his career or set his reputation as a reliable constable in stone? He sighed at the unknown. The right path might not lead him where he wanted, but it remained the correct path. His mind was set. He would have to ride the wave and hope he found land. The news had started and finished without his attention being caught, and the radio now filled the air with the noise of a classical piece he did not recognise, but it still soothed his tired mind. Three knocks at the door suddenly echoed through the building. He was caught unawares and stood absently, wondering who might be visiting so late in the morning when he might ordinarily have been walking his beat, or sitting behind his desk writing a report regarding a stolen pint of milk or a missing cat. He had half a mind not to answer it. He was more concerned about when the telephone would ring to warn him of the inspector's arrival. He was therefore unable to hide his surprise when he opened it to find him standing on the threshold. "'Good morning, Drew. I understand you are now feeling sufficiently rested to allow me the opportunity to question you,' the inspector explained with a comforting smile. "'Yes, inspector,' Drew faltered for a moment, flustered at the unexpected arrival of the future, of the lack of preparation he had been given. "'I was expecting a telephone call. You came awfully quickly.' My apologies, I admittedly took a chance on calling unannounced. I imagined you would be as eager to talk to me as I am to listen to you. Drew paused for a moment. The inspector, though serious in his tone, remained approachable, and Drew felt an overwhelming desire to trust him. 
Yes, of course. Delaying will only hold up your investigation, though I don't know what, if anything, you can learn from what I witnessed, or think I witnessed. The inspector nodded reassuringly. Whatever you tell me will be taken in the strictest confidence. Drew stared at the hall carpet, lost in his thoughts. The inspector waited what seemed to be a polite amount of time before asking, May I come in? It smells as though a fresh pot of tea has been made recently. Perhaps you could make me a cup and we can chat. Drew returned to the present with a shake of the head. Sorry, where are my manners? Please, come through. The inspector entered the house and was immediately hit by the sparseness of the place and the feeling of transience, of non-permanence that echoed from the bare walls and packing boxes. The inspector removed his coat and followed Drew through to the kitchen where he made the inspector a cup of tea. When they were both seated as comfortably as they could on the creaking wood of the old chairs around the rickety table, they took a few sips of their tea. So, why don't you begin at the beginning, with the telephone call you received from Banks. I won't interrupt or pose any questions to you until you reach the point that you arrived back in your bed. Drew took a deep breath and told the inspector everything. The telephone call, the slur in the sergeant's voice. He let flow his feelings towards Banks and the long list of jobs out of his jurisdiction that, that led to his clearing of the tree. The inspector nodded, sipped his tea and listened intently. Drew could not hold his gaze for long. His attention would drift to the steam from his tea, to the trees outside the window and to the fog that was slowly encapsulating them. He explained about the weather, the atrociousness of the conditions that made him want to lock all the doors and windows and hide under his duvet. He found himself revealing these candid feelings that he had not even wanted to admit to himself. He found that saying them out loud made them easier to bear until he reached the part of the tale where he saw the lights in his mirror. I wanted to move away from the turn in the road to find a safe place to turn around, and as I pulled away I saw in my mirror he trailed off, and suddenly the movement of the branches outside his window became hypnotising. He drifted off. The inspector remained silent, waiting, listening. He allowed Drew to find confidence. Two lights. I presumed them to be headlights, except... He paused again. His mind fought with the words he knew he had to say, battling with his better judgment as he tried to turn the thoughts to words. They were too high from the ground. They appeared in the exact spot I'd just driven through. They weren't moving, and uh, I felt as if they were watching me, or more like I was being dissected, scanned by them. And although I was full of fear, I found myself putting the car in reverse and backing up to them to try and work out what they were. The trees swayed, and he found watching their rhythmic movement through the mist helped him focus. They forced him on, forced him to relive the moment. As I got closer, they moved, off of the road, into the trees, where they disappeared. I could just make out a track in my headlights, so I turned the car into the trees and followed them in. I lost control of the car as it slid into the centre of the mud. I got out and looked around. I looked all round the mud, around the trees. I took photographs to try and see what was going on in the light of the flash. It was brighter than my torch, but I couldn't see anything. Even if it was daylight, I doubt I would have been able to see any movement. The trees were so thick, there were a million places to hide. My mind played tricks on me, turning shapes between the trees into crouching figures. Trunks became people hiding. The search was beyond me. It was an impossible task. But one thing I didn't see was anything that could have had headlights as bright as the lights I saw in my mirror. There were no vehicles, no tracks. Well, you saw for yourself. I was the only person to have driven into that place. Perhaps the only person to have ever driven in there. Eventually I gave up through fear and exhaustion. I had already realised that I would be spending the night in that horrible place, so I returned to the car to settle down. It wasn't until I went to turn the lights off that I saw it, the body I mean, laying in the mud. As I told you earlier, I hadn't seen it there before. I had been back and forth to the car, and the lights had been on the whole time, for what good they were, and I hadn't seen it. Then I radioed Banks to tell him, but I wasn't sure about what he told me, so I radioed through to Frank to tell him where I was and what I had found. He told me to stay there. He rightly pointed out that he had no chance of finding me in the storm, and as long as I secured the car, I was relatively safe. He said that he said he would have to talk to Scotland Yard about what happened and ask for guidance, which is where you come in. I've covered the body as best I could to try and preserve any evidence that might have been left behind. Then I settled down in the back seat, but I didn't really sleep much. I was too scared that whoever put that poor man there was still around and would want to do something similar to me. I guess I must have drifted into a doze, though, because I woke just before you arrived with Banks and Frank. I heard you before I saw you. The branches scraping down the sides of the car made a hell of a racket. 
and I suppose you know the rest. I showed you around the site, we got the car out, then I drove home. I had a bath and went to bed. Drew realised he had been talking for a few minutes without stopping. He just stared out of the window at the swaying branches. The inspector remained silent and waited to see if there was anything else that he wanted to share. When I woke up I had a cuppa, burnt some toast and called the station. Thank you Drew, that's a very helpful account of what happened, the inspector replied when he was sure Drew had finished. There was a moment's silence as the inspector thought through the story. Drew reasoned that he must be thinking on the lights. I know how some of it must sound, the lights I mean. I've been trying to find a logical explanation for them, perhaps it was an odd reflection of the moon, I don't know. They are indeed at the crux of your discovery, leading you so inexplicably as they did into the woods and to the body. The inspector shifted a little awkwardly on the uncomfortable chair. Rest assured that I believe you. I'm not here to accuse you of anything. In normal circumstances you would be our prime suspect. It stands to reason. However, these are not normal circumstances. Perhaps I should explain a little about the sort of investigations that the department I work with are involved in. I work for the Department of External Affairs. We deal with cases that have no apparent cause or that are beyond the understanding of the local police. Missing persons, unexplainable appearances of persons, mysterious appearances of bodies. These things happen often enough to warrant their own investigative force. We are part of the yard, we have our own means of investigation, and we don't always find explanations that would fit with the conventional. Drew sat and listened intently, with the feeling he was privy to information not usually shared. I tell you these things because you are my prime witness. I require you to work with me closely. Anything we see, you must keep a close secret. He reached for his case, and I need you to sign this. He pushed a wadge of paper across the table towards him. You may have heard of the Official Secrets Act. This is similar, but goes a lot further. It is more thorough, and anything that we will report on will remain a secret. If the truth became public, there is a strong chance that society would not be able to cope with the truth, and the strange forms it takes in the shadows and whispers our senses usually ignore. Drew's eyes flicked through the incomprehensible language the document contained, and he read a few points randomly. Events or non-events that witnesses comprehend to be real or imagined are property of H.M. Constabulary. Any communication regarding any such events, whether this be verbal, written or communicated physically, will be treated as an act of treason against the Crown. Ways and means beyond the average understanding are shaping and defining the lives and realities experienced by the general public on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, and the undersigned recognises that any part of their lives affected thusly will remain unchangeable. Drew looked up, shaking his head in confusion. What does it all mean? What will it mean to me and to my life, my career? Excellent questions. Essentially, it means that you no longer own the memories you are making. They belong to his Her Majesty. Any attempt you make to share them with anyone other than myself or any of our colleagues from the department will be taken very gravely. That's all very serious, Drew pointed out, flicking through the thick document he was expected to sign. What if I refuse? Refusal is seen as a break in the contract. You're already in the loop, Drew. You're a young man at a crossroads, not just in his career, but in his life. Sign, and you will discover that there is more to this world than you ever thought existed. Don't sign, and this path will be forever closed to you, and you will always wonder what it is you said no to, as you rot in a deep cell in the country's most secure mental institution. Drew's jaw dropped in shock and fear. His eyes widened as his life flashed before them. Sorry, that last bit was meant to be a joke, the inspector smiled timidly, offering him a pen. If you don't sign, then I take your statement. I walk out and continue my investigation without you. Honestly, that's all. Drew took the pen and held it hovering over the dotted line, his hand steady and still. He found the invitation too interesting and greatly desired to investigate it. He knew he was going to sign it, but enjoyed the last few moments of normality before the ink was on the paper. He then traced his signature in the date, slowly and carefully, across the dotted line. He passed the confusing document back to the inspector, who placed it carefully into his bag. Thank you. Now, can you please relate, as best you can, the conversation you had with Banks last night, after you discovered the body, and what he told you to do? The inspector asked. His words were stern, but diplomatic and businesslike. This was the professional side of the inspector. Logical, meticulous and determined. Chapter 12. The wind and rain battered his squad car relentlessly, 
adding to the feeling of abandonment. Drew picked up the receiver on his car's radio and waited for the operator to pick up the call. What number, please? Drew paused to consider. Banks is always first, that was the rule. Sergeant Banks, 5945. Please wait. The line went dead for a second, and the night felt a little darker. Drew switched his headlights back on to check the body was still there, and wasn't sure to be glad or not when he saw the man's back, arms outstretched, legs laying at awkward angles. Presently there was a ringing tone from the receiver, and it rang for a long time before being picked up. Who the hell is this? What the bloody hell are you calling me at this hour for? Banks yelled down the phone. Drew pulled the receiver away from his ear and waited for him to calm down. It's Drew, Sarge. I'm... I told you not to call me, you bloody fool. What is it? I found a body in the woods. Drew spoke quickly. There was a silence from the other end. You... you've what? Banks shouted. Drew could almost see the expression on his face as his tired brain tried to fathom the words. Banks faltered for a moment and surprised Drew by coming back to the mouthpiece very quietly and deadly seriously. Listen, Drew, we can't leave it out there all night. Put it in your car. Drive over to my place. Right now. I'll deal with it. Drew didn't know the correct procedure for discovering a body in these circumstances, but he was sure this wasn't it. Banks spoke with confident familiarity, as though he had done this before. Right you are, Sarge. Drew obliged the order, knowing he wouldn't go through with it. This is what they had been waiting for. Small problem. The car is stuck in mud. I need someone to get me out. He heard Banks swearing and coughing in the background. Stay where you are and I'll come and find you. Where are you? His voice was gaining volume again as the situation worsened. As he became angry, his voice became gravelled and full with menace, like heavy boots down a stone path. Drew hung up the receiver. He picked it up again and waited for the operator. What number, please? Sergeant Gates, Nettlewood, 7739. Putting you through now. The telephone rang but was answered a lot quicker this time. Hi, Drew, how are you? Frank answered immediately. Not good, Sarge. I found a body. A body? Bloody hell, mate, what's happened? Frank did little to hide his shock. Hard to tell. I'm in the middle of the copse, in an opening. I found it in here and now the car is stuck. Jesus, did you call Banks? Yes, he told me to put it in the boot and drive it to his house so he could deal with it. Drew listened intently to the earpiece. All he could hear for a moment was Frank breathing to reassure him that he was still there. What did you tell him? Frank asked. I told him I would, then hung up. Good work, Drew. Listen, I'm going to call the yard on this one. If you're stuck, you best stay put until I can get out there. Tell me where you are, Drew thought for a moment. About a mile south of the Firestone roundabout, there's a sharp bend in the road turning west. What's left of the fallen tree will be about 50 yards up there on the left, and the gap in the trees is about 10 yards after that. OK, you understand that it might not be tonight. You'll need to guard the body until we can get up there. Yes, Sarge, I guess I'd be staying. You get onto the yard. I'll stay here. See you in the morning, Drew said bravely. All right, Drew, stay safe. Drew hung up the receiver, then took it off the hook again in case Banks tried to contact him. Chapter 13 The inspector listened carefully as Drew retold the story, scratching his chin thoughtfully. Banks said he would deal with the body, he asked thoughtfully. Yes, Drew replied, already wondering if the inspector could be trusted, wondering whose side he would take. What did you think he meant when he said that? Drew pondered for a second. That he would take the body and it would vanish. That it would never appear on a report. No one would ever know about it. It would be buried and all evidence of it would disappear. And what about you? What do you think he would have done with you? Drew shuddered at the thought. I would be silenced, he replied darkly. Why do you think that? Drew shifted his weight uneasily. He knew he had to reveal everything, but this was his chance. This was the town's chance of having the wrongs of the past corrected. Because we have reason to believe that something like this has happened before. Someone discovered something that Banks was trying to hide, and they were silenced. The inspector lined the questions up in his head. By we, I take it you mean yourself and Sergeant Gates? Yes, this was it, Drew knew. This was the moment they had been waiting for all these years. They were about to discover if their hard work and sacrifice had been worth it. And what behaviour have you seen in Sergeant Banks that makes you think he has done something like this before? Drew took a deep breath. The only other person he had ever discussed this with was Frank. Ten years ago, Frank Gates' older brother Albert, my father, was made sergeant of Firestone. He narrowly beat Banks to the post. Albert died six months later in a car accident. The car was scrapped by Banks before any mechanical checks were made. Drew sighed, relieved to be getting the events off his chest to someone who may be able to take some action. 
and I presume Banks then took up the vacant post, the inspector began, seeing how the story would play out. Yes. Is there anything else about Banks I ought to know? Only what people say about him, or rather, what people don't say about him. Drew paused to think how to communicate what he was thinking. The inspector waited patiently. There are stories, things that are whispered that people would never openly discuss. Banks is the third generation, told the sergeant post. His father and grandfather had it before him, so for the last 70 years or so there has always been a Banks as sergeant at Firestone. Banks' father sold his farm, his business, his livelihood in order to take up the post. He gave up everything to become sergeant. That does seem odd. What experience does a farmer have as sergeant of a police force, the inspector pondered. Judging by how they have run the police force, none, Drew replied. There's more. The stories say that they are hiding something. Drew looked directly into the inspector's eyes, that they are protecting the town by hiding the inhabitants from something in the trees. Is that why you're here, Drew? Is that why you moved to Firestone, to try and find out what was going on? Yes, it was my idea. Frank and I have been close since my father's death. He filled the void that my father left when I was 14. As I grew, I learned more about banks, and entering the police seemed the best way to follow in my father's footsteps. Do you think your father may have discovered something about the Banks family, and this might have been why the current Banks didn't want the car examined? The presumption has always been that there is something being hidden, that there has never been any doubt in Frank Gates' mind that Banks was behind my father's death. The inspector held Drew's gaze. These are very serious accusations based on little or no evidence. You and Frank have been right to be cautious. The inspector remembered the muddy crater, and Banks tried to get to Drew. He saw now why he wanted to whisk Drew away perhaps to try and get him to change his story, perhaps for something worse. True, admittedly, but you don't know him or his reputation. I will add Banks to my list of things to investigate, the inspector informed him. As a course of forward action, I will suggest looking to see if your father kept any old records and reports. See if you can find any gaps or anything strange, the inspector thought for a moment. It has been a challenging morning for you, Drew. Shall we take a walk? A stroll might do you good. Drew was surprised at the sudden change of mood. Is the interview over? He glanced at his watch and was amazed to discover an hour had quickly passed. He had found the interview emotionally exhausting. Yes, the inspector smiled, sitting upright and stretching. Their mugs were empty. I can piece together some of the events from where your story ends. It was then that Frank Gates put the call through to the yard and I was brought into the investigation. I still want to chat about the lights you saw. I do believe that you saw them. As to what they are and how they are related to the appearance of our unfortunate Mr Barrow, I am still open to suggestions. He stood and began putting on his coat. Drew took this as his cue and began to prepare himself for an outing into the cold of the early afternoon sun. Anywhere in particular you would like to go? Drew asked as he pulled on his boots. Nowhere in particular. I would just like to have a walk. Perhaps if I get a feel for the town, meet some of its residents, it could open lines of inquiry I didn't know existed. Drew pulled his coat around his shoulders and the inspector opened the door. He braced himself against the cold and set off determinedly toward the small parade of shops the locals called town. Drew followed him downhill. The inspector was remarkably quick for someone of his age. He walked as if he knew exactly where he wanted to go. As they walked, they talked. Let us pretend for a moment that we did not just have that conversation regarding Sergeant Banks. Should he ask you what you have told me, tell him you found the body by accident and that you did not tell me about the orders he gave you. Hopefully, this will be enough to persuade him that you have not switched sides, that you can still be trusted. Do you want me to see if I can get him to reveal anything else? The inspector smiled as he had guessed that Drew was intelligent enough to see his plan. Yes, if you get the chance, see if you can't get him to tell you why he ordered you to pick the body up to take it to his house. I don't believe he would use being drunk as an excuse, although he might. If there is something else, another reason, he might tell you. Be brave, but be careful. He might only tell you because he is sure you won't get the chance to tell anyone else. Drew thought of the implications of the inspector's words. They had walked closer to the town's small centre. There were more houses on the side of the road. They came to the end of the road and appeared at a short parade of shops that Firestone called a town. It consisted of a fish and chip shop, a general grocer's store, a tea room, come cake shop, a butcher's and a fruit and vegetable shop. Do you want to do some shopping, inspector? Drew asked. Well, I am rather partial to a cake. Shall we pay a visit to the tea rooms, the inspector suggested. They strolled past the butchers, with fresh joints hanging in the window and a fine selection of cuts displayed beneath. The sign above their heads read, Johnson's Fine Meats, and a man in a bloodied apron stood behind the counter weighing out minced lamb for a po-faced old lady. Both turned and looked up as the men passed, and the inspector gave a friendly tip of his hat. 
All he received in ply was a pair of barely noticeable nods. That's Keith Johnson, inherited the business from his father, who probably inherited it from his, Drew informed him. And the lady he was serving, the inspector asked? Ivy Cole, widow of Ron Cole, the milkman, Drew replied as they strolled past. All of them, the butcher, the husband, and the widow, they have all lived in Firestone all their lives, Drew continued. Ivy Cole, no doubt a fully-fledged member of the rumour mill, the inspector asked. Yes, Drew replied with a smile, you could put it like that. No doubt we will meet some other members in the tea rooms. Good, the inspector smiled, pushing the glass panelled door. Firestone Tea Rooms was inscribed across the glass and printed ornately on the sign above the shop. A bell gave a pleasant ting as they entered and the four patrons of the tea rooms looked up to see who had come to join them that afternoon.